You're listening to the Jewel City Podcast. You can join us in person Sundays at 10 a.m. or 6 p.m. We have something for all people and all ages. Or join our live stream at 10 a.m. In this podcast, we'll hear a message from Pastor Robert from our Spring Revival. In praying for this uh, revival, my prayer had been that God would change. Uh, that God would change us beyond just uh, uh, the average, the normal. So tonight, I'm going to kick this thing off by uh, speaking to you tonight a message titled, Emptied. You might say, uh, have you ever went to the, let's say, Walmart or to a restaurant or whatever, and it's time to pay the bill, and you reach for your wallet, and oh, you forgot your wallet at home. Anybody ever do that? My father-in-law, before he passed away, he said every time I t- he took my wife out and, uh, and they met for lunch, she always said, oh, Dad, I'm sorry, I forgot my wallet at home. Uh, so just remember that wallet story, and I'll get back to that. You might say that there was a big wallet of divine resources that Jesus left at home when he came to earth. So I know I just had you sit down, and I, I shouldn't have, but stand with me out of, if you're able for the reading of the word. And I want us to go to the book of Philippians, chapter two, verse five. And I think I just gave verse five to the media team, but we're going ahead and read a few more verses. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now, I want to stop there again, and I want to say it again. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We need the mind of Christ. Can somebody say amen? Amen. So, Pastor Aaron, take that microphone to Miss Mary, and I'll pick up verse 6. Who being in the form of God, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Miss Mary, would you bless the reading of the word, please? Father, we just thank you, Lord, for what's already been accomplished in this house this evening, Lord. Father, we thank you for your presence, oh God. And I'm asking you, Lord, as this week goes on, I pray, God, that the temperature Mm -hmm. in this place rise. That's right. My God, that the Holy Spirit Mm -hmm. would have his way and you would sweep through this place. God, that lives would be changed. Change us, Lord. Change us. Make us that temple, God, that we need to be. I pray for my pastor tonight. I pray, God, as the week tarries, I pray, God, for added strength. I pray, God, tonight for supernatural strength. I pray, God, that you would minister to him and through him, I pray. God, I pray that lives, oh God, would be touched. Miracles would be done in this Mm -hmm. place, oh God, we pray. We ask you, God, just to bless, continue to bless Change us, make us what we need to be in Christ. Yes, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. This is, I believe, one of the most, uh, the greatest passages ever written about Jesus Christ. It paints the perfect picture of humility, the humility of Jesus. So tonight it is the mindset. Somebody say mindset. It is the mindset part that we want to focus on here. Paul is about to tell us some very important things about the identity and also the nature of Jesus. It gives us insight into who Jesus is. Also the nature of what he gave up in order to come to earth and be with you and I. So Jesus, his mindset is, uh, the mindset of Christ is to be the pattern that you and I should follow in our lives. Uh, There is uh, some things uh, that we gotta give up. And I pray tonight that uh, God, the Holy Spirit, would speak to each one of us and we would understand what God wants us to give up. So in Philippians chapter two, verse six, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. The passage says that Jesus Christ is God. 
yet he humbled himself to be a man. Can you imagine? That passage does not say that Jesus is not like, is, is like God. That passage says he is God. Do you hear what I'm saying? Jesus Christ is the person who dwelt in all the glory of perfection. But he humbled himself and he came to this corruptible world that you and I live in. Just imagine for a second the enormous step down that Jesus took to become a man. Very important. Let the mind of humility, the mind of Christ, let the mind of humility and lowliness surge through your mind. Are you humble? Jesus existed before his birth. You gotta grasp this. No one else can make this claim, nobody. What is the basis for this declaration that Jesus is in his very nature, God Almighty? The apostle John declared Jesus' divine pre-existence. In John chapter one, verse one through three, in the beginning was the word. Somebody say the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Jesus Christ the Son of God is the Word of God. He is the creator of life, the very being and essence of life. Christ was pre-existent. He was there before creation. Somebody say amen. So one of the names that was given to Jesus before his name Jesus was given by Mary and Joseph was the word, somebody say the word. The word spoke, crea spoke creation into existence in Genesis chapter one. So I want you to think about this. The entire nativity scene into which Jesus was born was created by him. Think about that. The stable was created by him. The animals, were created by him. Mary and Joseph was created by him. The shepherds were created by him. The gold and the frankincense and the myrrh was created by him. Jesus said in John 3 and 13, and no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the son of man which is in heaven. He came down from heaven. Now, Jesus was different from all other men. Do you hear me? All other men. We're talking about somebody by the name of Jesus and there's never been another one quite like him. Give God a hand clap and a shout of praise. His origin was out of heaven. Jesus' life did not begin in Mary's womb. My life began in the womb of Anna Shingleton. Do you hear me? What a great, great woman of God and a fantastic mother. He did not come from the seed of a man. Oh, I, was, I came from the seed of Bob Shingleton. Uh, what a wonderful man. Went to be with the Lord at 89 and I miss him and I miss my mom. Uh, but it won't be long, do you hear me, that the Lord will take me home and it will be not a revival, it will be a reunion. Do you hear me? With all the saints of God, somebody give him a hand clap and a shout of praise. So Jesus came to us from heaven, already fully in existence as God. Now John goes on to record Jesus' own declaration of his origin in a conversation to his disciples. Jesus said in John 16 and 28, I came forth from the Father and came into the world again. And I leave the world 
And I go back to the Father. In one brief statement, Jesus gave the whole plan of salvation. I came forth from the Father and I am come into this world. And Jesus came for one purpose and that is to seek and to save that which was lost. Anybody in the house ever been lost, uh, but now you've been found. Anybody in the house once was blind, but now you can see. You ought to give God a great hand clap and a shout of praise. I'm headed somewhere tonight. When you build a house, it takes a little while. It doesn't look like a lot's going on until the foundation is done. And then you begin to build and sooner or later the roof comes on it. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor. neighbor. He'll put the roof on it. So Jesus is the second person of the Godhead, the Son. So we go back to Philippians 2 and 6, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Very important that you understand this. Jesus did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Sometimes you, if, if you come from a, an important family, you can drop a name. And that'll get you in places. That'll get you around some places. Jesus did not consider equality with God something to be used in his own advantage. So Paul was making it clear that Jesus relinquished access to his divine power in order to walk among us as a human being. God, Jesus, the Son of God, relinquished everything that he had to come and be a human being among us. Elsewhere, Paul twice spoke of Jesus in connection with Adam. Reference only in Romans 5, verses 12 through 19, and 1 Corinthians 15, 21 through 49, the first Adam. Described in the Genesis creation story, was created by God without sin. God took the dust of the ground and formed Adam out of it. Breathed into his nostrils. And Adam became a living soul, born without sin. However, Adam didn't remain without sin. And when he was tempted in the garden by Satan, he fell. And when he fell, there was consequences. When you and I fall and we fail, there is consequences. He was banished from God's presence and ultimately death. Suffered by not just Adam, but by the entire human race that he represented. Paul writes in Romans 5 and 12, wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. You are looking at a sinner tonight and this sinner is looking at a house full of sinners. Do you hear me? But I'm telling you tonight, by the grace of God, you don't have to stay that way. So in contrast, Paul described Jesus as the second or the last Adam. The only other human, Scotty, to begin his life on earth without sin. My goodness, my goodness. Unlike the first Adam, when Jesus was tempted by Satan in the wilderness, he did not fall. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, he did not fall. I want to read to you Matthew chapter four. Then was Jesus led up of the spirit. Somebody say the spirit. Can I stop there? Media, they don't have this. The Lord just gave it to me moments before I came out here tonight. So we have God the Father. We have God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. The Trinity always was and always is and always will be. Do you hear me? So the original creation in Genesis 1 and 2, and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And what? And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. 
So we got proof that the Spirit has always been from the beginning of time. In Genesis 1 and 26, and God said, let us, let us make man in our own image, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now let's go back to Matthew chapter four. Then Jesus was led up of the what? Of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward hungered. Hungered. We look at God here on earth that he had no problems. He's God. But he relinquished all of his power and he came to earth to be a man. He faced everything that we face. Do you hear what I'm saying? But he answered and he said, it is written, Whew. man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple. And he saith unto him, if thou be the son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee. And in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus said unto him, it is written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And again the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all of the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And saith unto him, all these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. And then saith Jesus unto him, get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. You might want to try using the word of God, because in the tough times, the Lord Jesus Christ said, it is written. And what happened in the end? The devil left him, and the angels came and ministered to him. Why? he was here on earth, if he was all powerful God, then we would have not needed the angels to come. He relinquished everything that he had and stepped down and became a man that he could experience everything that you and I are going through. God knows how to handle your hurt and your pain. Give him a hand clap and a shout of praise. When we place our faith in Christ, we officially declare that Jesus, the second Adam, is our new representative before God. Whew. In the words of Jesus, in just reference only in John 3 and 3, you must be born again. My God, we're here for a revival to be filled up with the presence of God. But if you're here tonight and you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, friend, you must be born again. There is no other way to enter into heaven but by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Give him a hand clap and a shout of praise. Uh, thank him for the blood. Now I want you to remember Philippians 2 and 6, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Jesus, who did not consider equality with God something to be used at his own advantage. The sin of the first Adam is tied directly to the grasping after equality with God. Satan said, if you'll just do this, you'll just be like God. Do you hear me? The world still tells us that today. Jesus qualified himself as our representative by reversing the first Adam's disqualification. The first Adam was disqualified, but the second Adam in Jesus Christ has not been disqualified and will not be disqualified. He is my representative. He is seated at the right hand side of the throne of God, interceding on my behalf and on your behalf. Give him a hand clap and a shout of praise. 
by letting go of his divine privilege so he might properly represent you and I. Biblical writers acknowledge Jesus as our representative when they refer to him as our high priest. Listen in Hebrews 4 and 15. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. We can be comforted in knowing that Jesus faced temptation and he can sympathize with you and I. You that are carrying anxiety, what do we see in the Garden of Gethsemane when he felt the pressure of the world upon him? You that are going through sickness, everything, whatever you may have in your life tonight has been nailed to the cross of Calvary, and he knows exactly what you and I are going through, and he knows exactly what we need. Uh, do you hear me tonight? Give God a hand clap and a shout of praise. In becoming human, Jesus chose, somebody say he chose, to subject himself to the same limitations that we have as human beings. You've got to understand that. He chose to leave everything behind. He chose the same limitations that we have as beings to represent us fully identify with our human weakness and our limitations. Jesus made a choice. He made a choice to empty himself. So remember I started out with Philippians two and five. And I sure could use some AC in the house. <laughs> Philippians two and five. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who made that decision to leave everything behind? It was the son's decision. In Philippians two and seven, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Christ emptied himself and became a man, the sovereign Lord of the universe. He who existed in eternity and in perfection, in glory and majesty, in dominion and power, stepped down and became a man Stepped down and became a man and not only a man, but a servant of men. Some translations read, he made himself nothing. In the Greek it reads, he emptied himself. So of what precisely did he empty himself? When Jesus left heaven to become a human being, he freely chose to empty himself of the privileges of deity or his divine attributes. You gotta stay with me, please. These attributes are sometimes called the three omnis. Omnipresence means unlimited presence. Omniscience means unlimited knowledge. Omnipotence, unlimited power. He emptied himself of unlimited presence, unlimited knowledge, and unlimited power. Had he not, he would not be able to take advantage of his position as God. If he hadn't left all that behind, Excuse me, he would have been able to take advantage of his position as God and nothing he did would have mattered because everyone, we would have said, well, he went through all that at the cross. He didn't feel it because he was God. Very important, he did not lose these attributes. He just left them behind. You remember the wallet story, how I started off? When you forget your wallet at home, 
If you've not relinquished, you can pick that back up when you get home. He only temporarily relinquished. When Jesus took on flesh, he shifted positions from being above the angels to being below them. The writer of Hebrews clarified that it was not a forever shift. In Hebrews two and nine, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels. God help me. For the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Had he not, he would not have been able to take advantage of his position. He would have been able to take advantage of the position of God. In Matthew 26 and 53, thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father and he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels? If he had not of relinquished every power that he had, could he not have called him himself? Think about this. The release of these angels were not within his power, but at the command of God. This must be understood of him as a man. For as God, the angels were his creatures and ministering servants, but the Lord at that time could not, unless he could call upon the Father, but once he called upon the Father, he would abort the Father's plan because he trusted in the plan of God why God had sent him there, and he knew that he was wrapped up in the Spirit of God, and he was in the triune, and God was going to walk with him through this. We're going somewhere. We're going somewhere. Jesus took on the lower position with us, but it was not a permanent thing. So after he returned to this heavenly home, 33 years later, he picked these attributes back up, so to speak. Listen to Philippians 2 and 9. We see a father's declaration. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus right now is sitting at the right hand of the Father in heaven with full access to his unlimited presence, to his unlimited knowledge, and to his unlimited power. Jesus voluntarily stooped down to our level to show us how to live, and that is exactly what love does. Do you hear me? And I heard earlier in the week that love changes things. Has the love of God ever changed your life? Give him another hand clap and a shout of praise. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, He's starting to put the roof on it. So let's talk about what we need to leave behind. In a letter to the believers in Ephesus, Paul gave them this instruction. He said in Ephesians 5, verse 1, Be you therefore followers of God as dear children. The Message Bible says, Watch what God does and then do it like children who learn proper behavior from their parents. The Greek word Paul used in encouraging us to follow God's example is mimetea. And it's the root word from which we get our word mimic. Just as children imitate their parents, we should imitate Christ. His great love for us led him to sacrifice himself so that we may live. So our love for others should be the same kind. Romans 12 and nine, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Living in an empowered life is not out of reach. 
I didn't know whether to preach this message tonight. You know, this morning we were all shouting and singing and dancing and I was preaching up and down the aisles. But I know that the Spirit of the Lord has spoke to my heart about all that's good, but we need changed. And in order to have change in our life, we need to learn some things. Can someone say amen? amen. Paul not only gave, excuse me, gave up the priceless peace of God and he also took hold of it for himself, Paul. In 1 Corinthians 11 and 1, be you followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Remember Jesus emptied himself, his voluntarily. He left behind access to unlimited presence, unlimited knowledge, unlimited power. Stand with me tonight. So with Jesus as our model, you and I can make a similar move. So we ask ourselves, what do I need to leave behind? Ask yourselves that question. What is the main thing that we need to leave behind? You need to hear me, it's three words, three words. Giving up control. Giving up control. How many likes to be in control? Huh? Raise one hand. How many's had that problem more than a year? Raise two hands. How many's dealt with it all your life? Both hands, both feet. Right? We need to relinquish the control that we think we have over our lives and pass it on to the one that actually has control over our lives. Now, I'm gonna show you something that I've never seen before. Mark chapter four, verse 35. And the same day when the evening was come, and he saith unto them, let us pass over unto the other side. Jesus is speaking. If he knew there was a storm coming, would he have put them out there on the water? And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships and there arose a great storm of wind and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship asleep on a pillow. Asleep. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? The disciples suddenly found themselves in a position that was beyond their control. You don't like that, do you? You don't like to find yourself. I don't like to find myself suddenly in a position that I have no control. Visualize what's going on, a severe storm, rolling black clouds, gusts of wind, heavy drops of rain. One commentary said, like pellets, like pellets. While all the turmoil was going on, Jesus was in the back of the ship, sleeping. He's at rest, at peace. Do you not care? Is he sleeping because he's the all-powerful God? I don't think so. I don't think so. He's sleeping because he's at peace with God. In the midst of the storm, he rested perfectly in the care of God. Remember, Jesus emptied himself of unlimited presence, unlimited knowledge, and unlimited power. They were terrified. And Jesus appeared to be surprised or puzzled by their fear. 
Jesus asked a question. Why are you so afraid? What you're going through in life right now, church, why are you so afraid? Why are you so fearful? He said, how is it that you have no faith? And they turned to each other in verse 41, and they feared exceedingly and said one to another, what manner of man is this that every, even the wind and the sea obey him? I would assume that we've all either read this story in this room or we've heard about it and just believe Jesus wasn't afraid because he was God. Remember, Jesus emptied himself of omnipresence. He was in the boat and had no other choice because he'd emptied himself of omnipresence and he couldn't leave the boat. He had emptied himself of all knowledge. And I believe I'm right. And I've prayed about this, whether to preach this message or not. And I've sought counsel. And I believe I'm 100% right to say he didn't even know the storm was coming. Because he had relinquished everything and stepped down even below the angels. The angels are not omnipresent. The angels do not have the power. He left everything behind and he knew what that storm was all about. But he said, no matter what the storm, I'm gonna lay down and I'm gonna rest. I don't believe for a second that he knew the storm was coming. But I know one thing, he knows the storm calmer. And this whole message come to me from a few things that I'd read, but God began to speak to me even as I was driving down the road. You and I, we don't have to fear nothing, Vern. We gotta trust in the Holy Spirit of God because the Holy Spirit of God is our comforter. Amanda, in the hospital the other night, you don't know the volumes you spoke to me, battling cancer, the joy of the Lord on her face, and she said these words, God's got this. She said, and I don't understand why church people don't understand this, but she said, God's got this, and in my mind, I knew the message that I had for tonight. And I'm thinking about Jesus in the boat. He landed and he said, God's got this. God's got this. I hope you look at him in a different view tonight. He experienced everything that you and I will ever go through. And he said, God got this. But then when he got back to heaven, he picked everything up that he had and he is all knowing, he is all not present. He's got the power, do you hear me tonight? He's God Almighty, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. You don't have to worry, you don't have to struggle. He had emptied himself, he had emptied himself. The power required to calm the storm came from the Holy Spirit. The, what you need tonight to calm your storm is the Holy Spirit. And he'll calm your storm. Jesus found himself in a situation that was beyond his control. And you and I find ourselves in situations always beyond our control. When I had them five strokes, there was nothing I could do except trust in the Holy Spirit. You have found yourself in a situation where your sons and your daughters may be on drugs, but I'm here tonight to tell you it is out of your control, but it is not out of the Holy 
Holy Spirit's control. You may have found yourself in a broken marriage uh, and it may look like it is out of your control, but it is not out of your control because the Holy Spirit is still alive and still well and walking up and down every aisle. You may have found yourself in a financial situation that seems to be out of your control, but with the Holy Spirit, it is not out of His control. Give God a hand clap and a shout of praise. Come on, church, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Woo! He found himself in a situation Jesus found himself in a situation that was out of his control, yet he had access to the power in his powerlessness. <laughs> he had access to the power in his powerlessness. You and I have access. I got access to the power when I don't have it. I got access. I can come boldly to the throne room of God. My access is the blood of Jesus Christ. No weapon formed against us, brother, shall prosper. Do you hear me? Greater is he that lives in you and I than he that lives in this world. Oh! Pastor Rita, come stand right here. Pastor Aaron, come stand right here. Power, empty yourselves. You need to hear this. Empty yourselves of the illusion of control so that you can find freedom in the one that really has the control. You don't have no control. You don't know that you'll wake up tomorrow. Am I right, Kim Southern? Huh? had a heart, slight heart attack, 100% blockage this week, earlier in the week. By God's grace, she's here tonight. It was out of her control, but it was not out of the Holy Spirit's control. They were in a ship and they were worried. What worry do you have? What worry do you have? Why don't you come forward and ask somebody to pray with you? If you got anxiety, you got depression, you're worried about something, come and ask these two pastors to pray for you. I'm not gonna beg you. I'm not gonna beg you. If you wanna wait till Friday night to get revived, if you wanna wait till Friday night to get released, uh, then that's fine. But I, I, I'm just encouraging you to come tonight. Come tonight and let them pray for you. Let them pray for you. Help us, God. I want you to search your heart tonight. Do you know that you know that you know that it is well with your soul? Is your heart right with God? If death was to knock on your door tonight, would heaven be your home? Friend, if you can't answer boldly 100% yes, friend, you are lost tonight. But before you leave tonight, your name can be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. The Lord Jesus can save your soul. If you're here this evening and you've never accepted Christ and you'd like to right now quickly, just hold your hand up high. Would you hold your hand? I'll see your hand. Somebody else, somebody else, somebody else, somebody else, somebody else, somebody else tonight, somebody else. I'm going to drag you. I'm going to carry. Is it well? You to raise your hand, I want you to open up your heart. And this is a serious thing. And ask the Lord to forgive you of your sins. To repent means to turn. Say, Lord, there's gonna be a change in my life. Lord, I ask you to forgive me. From this day forward, I do my very best to live my life for you. Teach me your ways, Lord. Guide me and direct me. In Jesus' name I pray. Somebody will be coming to you and bringing you a Bible and, and talking and praying with you. Church, give God a hand clap and a shout of praise. We bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. 
Thank you for listening to the Jewel City Podcast. You can join us in person Sundays at 10 a.m. or 6 p.m. We have something for all people and all ages. Or join our live stream at 10 a.m. 